Good evening. Hello, I'm Penn Billington and I'm the editor of Touchstone, the Obod magazine, a Druid author and a Druid speaker. It's hard to believe that we've gone live. So hello, Chris Parker, first one who's joined that says people are around out there. That's fabulous. Thank you, Chris. Chris actually made me this fabulous Arwen pendant. He's a real craftsman. This symbolizes the um, inspiration of Druidry. And there's Kelly, Beth from Italy, Danny, hello, Danny, and Alan, Mary, hello to you all. This is wonderful. I'm so glad there are people out there. There's Jane Myatt, yep, all the way from Calgary, and Jackie from two miles down the road. Isn't that wonderful? Absolutely brilliant. There are some people coming from Kent, from Austria. Oh, hi, Jules. Yvette and Rebecca. Ah, hello, Athens. Hello, Daniel from Athens, Cassandra. And I can see people are not only saying hello to me, but they're meeting up in their own little group. So they've started saying hello to each other there as well. Don't get too distracted, folks. Uh, but do keep the comments and hellos coming. This is, oh, someone from Germany there now. And Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Hello, I'm going to just, I don't know if you've got my hello, Dania. So I'm going to give you a like, but I can't do that all the way through. Or I'll get far too distracted, of course because you want to know what I'm going to talk about this evening. Okay, so I sit before you tonight as a badger, in one sense, a badger. Already all over the world, I can hear howls of disappointment saying how boring. Last time she talked about unicorns. Well, we're hearing it for the badger tonight, so, and I'll explain why in a moment. Hello, Tara. Hello, Tammy from Alabama. And Dakota from North Carolina. And David from Guildford. Yes, it is very hot, David, isn't it? Yep. Annette from South Australia. Carol from Worthing. And Pat from Ulster. This is brilliant. Okay, so a lot of people heard I'm going to be a badger and there are hearts going up the screen and they didn't switch off. That's very good. I want to start by mentioning Philip's last um, post because I thought it was really, really good and really interesting. I'll just say hello to Kat and to Beverly, to Helen and Aidy from New Zealand and from he to Heather. And then I'll tell you, I really liked Philip's Sanctuary of the Heart. So let's all have a sip of our tea and decide why it was good. Philip's Sanctuary of the Heart was wonderful because of the imagery that he used. The idea of the garden, the walled garden with the tree in the centre is as old as time and as old as humanity and as old as religion. It's in all of the major religions uh, and mythologies. Um, and our, our word for paradise comes from uh, the root of it means a walled enclosure. And that comes from old French, but way before that, it's back from ancient Iranian and from Sanskrit, long before the common era. So the idea of paradise being a walled garden, a sanctuary for human beings, is uh, a place where there is only harmony and peace, is very, very old. Thank you for the hearts and hi to Lillian. Great to hear from you. And to Margaret from Arizona. So, when we think of the sanctuary of the heart, of sitting in the middle of a walled garden with a tree, under the tree, what feelings does it evoke within us? It evokes the feelings of um, depth and connectedness, of security, of safety of being at home, 
in our surroundings. And when we go into our inner space and we feel like that, when we feel, then we allow ourselves to feel completely right where we are. And the pull and the glamour of the outside world has subsided and we know that what we are and our internal resources are enough for us. That's really valuable from, for everyone on the spiritual path. And that is the feeling that we need to access. Um, and Philip giving us that meditation gives us a, a place to go back to time and time and time again. It tells us we're at home, we're enough. Hello, Niall from Ireland and David from Devon. Aha, uh -huh. and already we're getting some good comments about the badger. We'll get back to the badger in a minute. Because I want to contrast this idea of being at home and being safe with a very contrasting image. I was giving a talk and a workshop for 20 Dutch people on Friday. And the last question I was asked, because they'd all wandered around Glastonbury, was, what's all this with the hares then? And I thought about it. You know if you've been to Glastonbury, there are hares everywhere. There are hairs on mugs and tea towels, stick on hair tattoos. Uh, there are hair mouse mats, so we'll call them hair mats. You can get the magical animal, the hair, in just about every form that you want. Um, so why is the hair so important to us at the moment? Um, I've noticed, uh, I've been charting the progress of the hair over the last few years. Um, and it's sort of gone up the lead table of mythical animal, animals into the stratosphere. And now I think it's the main uh, sort of magical animal of the 21st century. And you can see that I've honoured the hare with a um, Will Worthington picture behind me tonight. A wonderful picture of the hare. Um, hi to John and Linda. Good to have you here. We'll talk about our work a bit later. Um, so just think of the two things the depth of sanctuary and the image of the hair which is the opposite isn't it because it's a really good thing if you play, play want to play a game with your grove to ask people to immediately think of an association with the hair everyone will have one everyone will be different because the hair is a trickster a runner a flyer a persecuted animal a magical animal an animal of transformation it can turn into uh, a witch can turn into a hare a hare can turn into a woman um hares can go and drink the milk of cows and then return and uh, so on there are myriads it's quite a good game to play i'm sorry if i'm majorly pixelated um, I hope I look like a green man in the way that Philip did, and I hope that you can still hear me. Um, so we've got those two images, and both of them, I think, are very necessary to spiritual seekers and to magical workers. Because here we get on to the second, uh, a second talk of Philip's I want to reference. Do you remember a few weeks ago, he talked about um, the difference between a mystic and a magician. I really wanted to join in with that because I have a lot of ideas about the mystic and the magician. It seems to me that the one thing that Philip didn't say was a quote from W.G. Gray, which was when you want to be a magician, decide to be a magician, what you're doing is taking responsibility for co-creating your world. Now, the magician obviously relates hugely to the, where am, I, where am I pointing? To the hare behind me. The hare as a magical animal. We, let me think what I'm saying. Aha, we got into Taliesin was a hare. Yes, we'll get to Taliesin in a minute. Rebecca, good. Google's working for Rebecca. That's good. So comparing and contrasting these two images, if we want to be a mystic, 
and a magician both are very necessary to us because the mystic would be happy to sit in the garden and make his connection with the depths, with the heights, and through that to the divine. But when we want to be a magician as well, a magician is about relationships, making other relationships with other people, with the world, and wanting to create the world for the better for ourselves and for other people. To do that, we have to access magic. And the hair, through its mythology and symbology, signifies magic to us. So hurrah! We should all be hares. Well, not necessarily. I think we seem to have gone a bit overboard for the hair, and it's because it's the perfect icon for a 21st century of no contract phones, zero hours contracts, uh, having no trust in governments and systems, because when you think about it, the hare is constantly running and flying. It has nowhere to rest. It has nowhere to lay, it doesn't lay its head in the same place twice. It makes its nest, it, uh, it grows its young, and then it's off again. It would be good to be a hare, to be a magical worker, like a hare. Um, in order to drink a bottle of wine and not have a hangover, dance in ecstasy and never pull a muscle, be a credit card hobo and run around the world without having to worry about your carbon footprint. We can do that in tiny allotments of our magic. But I'm sitting here as a badger because I think the balance to that wonderful ecstatic hair energy that's so prevalent is the badger energy. What do badgers stand for? Well, a friend of mine had a badger path in a garden of a new house. And they said, never mind, we're going to dig up the garden and the badgers will soon move. Huh, never gonna happen. Badgers trundle along the same ancestral paths for generation after generation. Badgers are clean animals. Always good if you're going to emulate an animal, choose a nice clean one. Badgers are um, animals with relationships. They have families. They uh, live in cosy, clean underground quarters. They do the things they've always done. They clean up a lot of our mess, don't they? They eat slugs and snails and all that disgusting stuff. Um, and. Uh, all in all, they're of use in the world, but a steady, gentle, unnoticed use that relies on tradition. Now, if we take the badger by himself, I think we could become boring old reactionaries. The sort of people say, I do this because it's the way I've always done it. And that's a, no, um, no disrespect to anyone whose accent I was taking off. I have no idea where I was meant to be coming from there. The sort of people who boast they've, have a ne uh, they've never changed their mind, never changed their principles in 50 years. That would be a bit badger-like maybe, but the badger with the leavening of the hair, that is the perfect mix, absolutely perfect, because you've got the tradition, the solidity, the rhythm, the routine, all the things that you need to keep your life, your everyday life on an even keel, to leave your time, your extra time, free for the magic. Um, so a group of us have been doing this. I ha have a small group of Druids uh, who've been doing something called the Druid Hide, where we've been badgers and we've just walked the same part of the land, our own little bit of land, for six months now. And what we've noticed, a lesson in survival, hair is a lesson in survival, that's right. But badger is a, thank you, uh, Sarah, but badger is a lesson in continuity, isn't it? Generation after generation, the one thing we seem to have lost. Um, so, 
where does Philip's sanctuary fit in, sanctuary meditation? The sanctuary of the heart is the place of generation, the place of depth, the place we can return to again and again and again. And through being secure in ourselves and our inner senses, we can then go out into the world to make magic. And what this little exercise, the six month exercise called the Druid's Hide has taught me and various other uh, members of the group is that if you look to the natural world for what is actually there, not symbolically there, but what's actually happening, the, examining the minutiae of life as it is, leads you into a world where you frequently have to use words like wonder, magic, inspiring, miraculous. So by following the routines of druid training, of walking your own path, not trying to find big magic or symbolism in anything, but just observing and noticing and going within and being still in yourself, the magic becomes apparent. So that instead of being like a leaping hare and whoosh, going out to try and run after the magic and running into the sunset and beyond and maybe never finding it. If we plod along like the badger, we find that instead of rushing after the magic, we are opening ourselves to it. Now, I've got a few interesting comments coming up here. I'm sorry I can't look at all of them or keep losing my thread, as you've noticed. Um, here today, gone tomorrow, yes. Stability and groundedness. Uh, someone making a comment about, uh, yes, they like a glass of wine as well. Um, in order to understand the dance, one must be still. And in order to truly understand stillness, one must dance. This is from Rumi and it comes from Ellie. Thank you, Ellie. Yeah, lots of lovely, lovely um, uh, comments here. So I suggest we take all these uh, ideas in now and just do a couple of minutes of uh, visualization, um, as you always uh, habitually finish with. Um, and uh, those comments are still coming, but for the moment, Let's just settle down and remind ourselves of where we are enough. Enough is enough. Life is enough. And whatever our circumstances, whatever our state of health, whatever's going on around us, for this moment we are in the right place and we are enough. Just settle down and if you'd like to, drop your eyelids or allow your eyes to close gently. And imagine that you are walking through a mist. We can do this very fast because we have trained imaginations. Through the mist, we see a gate in a wall. And we realize we're walking through an outer courtyard and we're coming to a gate of an enclosed garden. And we open the door and we step into our little paradise. And we walk across the green sward or we walk by the cobbled paths. It's evening time. We can smell the scents of the flowers, see the first moths. As we, we make our way to a glorious tree in the middle of the lawn. And as if the space has been made just for us, we sit underneath it. And we take three breaths. One with the earth beneath us. One with the sky above us, the evening sky. Sunset and moon, but still plenty of light.
and let's say the community of global druids and friends all around us who are sharing this meditation. And just be happy, completely contented, sitting with every sense alert to the smell of the garden in the evening, to the sound of the rustle of the leaves, to the evening song of the birds as they begin to settle and roost, to the feel of the warm wind, the breeze on your skin, You can almost taste the clear evening air, uh, air. All is well in your inner world. And you breathe that feeling in and you breathe that feeling out. And lazily, lazily, your eye moves along the perimeter wall, through the shrubs and the flowers. And lazily, your eyes stop where you see a darker patch at the base of the wall. And in a flash, you see a snout emerge from a hole in the ground, a striped face, a badger emerges and quietly trundles off along his age old path, off on his evening travels. Wish him well and feel in, in the ground beneath you all the wonder of the living earth and the animals under the earth, the nurturing earth that feeds all mankind, all humankind, all the animals and insects. And when the feeling of the badger is just a distant memory, you've followed him as far as you can in your imagination on his travels. He might be a field away by now. Then look towards the sunset. And suddenly leaping through a hole in the wall, you see a, a hair. It stands stock still. You can see its whiskers quivering, even at this distance. You can see its ears constantly moving. You can see its alertness. You can feel the magic that shimmers from it. Its huge round eyes gaze at you and in a flash it is off and away through the wall again by another hole and you imagine it racing towards the moon through the cornfields towards the last sheaf of corn leaving behind in the quiet gentle, peaceful garden, the shimmer of magic. And deep in your heart space, you feel the rhythm and the gentle energy of the badger. And deep in your heart space, you feel the shimmer of life 
and alertness and magic of the hair and they're both perfectly balanced within you. And with that realization that you're keeping them safe and can access them at any time, your body feels the need to reassert itself. You look round your paradise garden, your sanctuary of the heart, knowing that in a moment it will fade like mist in a morning meadow. As you stand up and stretch under the tree and consciously walk away and walk back to your physical body that needs a good stretch now and a good yawn, and you need to allow the inner image to disappear as you come back to your waking self and smile at your computer screen at all the friends across the world that you don't, haven't met yet. Thank you. So, ah, Henri says, I saw three big wild live badgers recently. First time I've seen one all running towards me or across my path. It was magical. Yes. Hua Fern said, I had a foot race with one when I was 12 years old. I think, I think you're the leader in a field of one there. Congratulations to you. I love badgers says Rebecca, yes. Thanks, Jules, thank you for your kind comments. And thank you, Jane. It's time for us to say goodbye now. I've kept you far longer than I'm should, I'm should. 